tonight. Um, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have the pleasure to welcome James Teague as our speaker for Family Night. Um, she's asked me to wel welcome James. Um, he said you've known him most of the longest. Well, I most probably have, apart from, apart from uh, Jim Coyle, who most probably has known the Teague family longer than, than I have. But, so James, welcome to the family night at the Harrogatinium. James is a group leader for uh, HCPT 144, which is the group based in the Chiswick area. Although James has and does still live in the uh, local Harrow area himself. HCP HCPT take disabled and disadvantaged young people on pilgrim holidays to Lourdes in the south of France. James has traveled to Lourdes over 12 times, four of these as group leader. James's family has been involved with HCPT now for 30 plus years, if not even longer. James is also a science teacher at Haberdasher School in Elstree. And in his spare time, if he has any, James runs a scouts group in Harrow and is a very keen cyclist, having recently, just before lockdown, cycled from Land's End to John O'Groats. So yeah. he does keep himself busy. So James, hopefully you can hear us, or you can hopefully you'll be on view very soon. Can I hand over to you to tell us more about HCPT? Thank you very much, and thank you for the fantastic introduction there. I'll try and live up to it. Um, yeah, um, good evening, everyone. It's great to see you, see everyone. And uh, this, it's really nice to see some uh, some faces I've not seen for a while. Hello to the Coils. Um, in fact, Jim, speaking of the cycling, you, you might not have noticed, but I actually cycle past you often on your morning walk on the way to school. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's great to see everyone sort of in a, in a new context. Um, so my first question to everyone, uh, has anyone heard of the HCPT? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm really pleased yeah. that people have heard of it. Excellent. Um, and we'll get on to sort of exactly what the HCPT is um, sort of in a little bit. But I thought I'd start by telling you a story that really gives the, um, the spirit of, of what the HCPT is about. Um, and um, yeah, in fact, yeah, we'll start with the story. So... There's a place in the south of France, uh, not called Lourdes, actually called Gavani. Um, and just to sort of set the scene of what Gavani looks like, um, it's up in the mountains and in the winter, it's a ski resort. Um, so imagine, you know, you sort of go up the valley and there's just ma there's mountains, sort of snow, snow capped sort of everywhere you can see. Um, and there's lots of hills and everything kind of leading up to the big mountains. And on top of one of the smaller hills, um, is a little statue, well, it looks little from a distance, but it's quite big when you get there, but a statue uh, of Our Lady of the Snows. Now, there's a coach travelling up to Gavani, and sort of it starts off just sort of, you know, normal kind of French countryside. You're going through all, all the little villages, and you get higher and higher. The views get more and more spectacular. Uh, and there's a young man looking out the window. Uh, unfortunately, the young man, he's paralysed from the waist down, he's in a wheelchair, but he's looking out the window and absolutely loving the trip, loving the views. Um, as he gets sort of higher, we, we, you know, the coach is pulling into Gavani and he spots this statue up on top of the hill and he's sitting next to a helper um, who's, you know, who's come with him, he's been helping him on the week as part of their group. And he says to the helper, you know, that is, you know, an amazing thing up there. I'd, I'd really love to go and see that, but I know that I, you know, I'd, I'd never be able to do that. And Elpa says, well, you know, you tell me, do you really want to go and see that? He says, well, actually, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, I would, I'd love to. So the helper went and spoke to some of the other, the other helpers that were with the group. They worked out with the group leader and actually they carried this young man all the way up this sort of rocky path up to, up to this statue and carried him up there so he, he could go and visit it um, and you can imagine how excited he was to do it something he never thought he'd be able to do um, this young man you know he was only sort of 12 13 years old doing this he never thought he'd be able to do it um, and the helpers that went sort of with the HCVT made this happen um, and I say that story along with a, a couple of others like it while I got involved originally because uh, my dad was the person that that the child asked and he sorted it out 
um, with the other helpers in the group, they carried him up there. Uh, it wouldn't quite pass health and safety nowadays. This was about 30 years ago, but um, <laughs> they, they did it and he got up, he came down, you know, memories made for life there. Um, and that's really what the HCPT is all about. Um, it's giving young people opportunities um, to go to go to Lourdes, um, do everything they normally do there. Um, but, you know, finding a way to make it happen. You know, if a young person can't do something, finding a way to make it happen. Um, so that that is what the HCPT is all about. Um, now, if for those that haven't heard of HCPT, uh, it, the, the, the letters used to stand for something else, what it currently stands for is the Hosanna House Children's Pilgrimage Trust. Uh, and it's, a, as Ed's introduced, it's a charity taking disabled and disadvantaged young people on a pilgrimage holiday to Lourdes. Uh, in, in France, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it, but I'll introduce Lewis a little bit more later. Um, so for one week a year, I get to put on my green hat uh, and I become the group leader for Group 144, uh, which, which runs these trips. Um, it's all part of the charity and we travel during the Easter week. Uh, and there's hundreds of groups and thousands of young people and helpers that travel to Lewis as part of the Easter pilgrimage. Um, which with, with all the, the, you know, the COVID things going on unfortunately last year's trip was cancelled uh, and this year's trip is but next year we're back um fingers crossed um so in terms of the history of the hcpt it was started in 1956 by a catholic priest uh, brother michael strove who sadly passed away in 2019 um and the, the reason it was set up was to take disabled and disadvantaged young people on this pilgrimage holiday to Lourdes in the south of france and the reason Lourdes was chosen is because it's a place of healing. And the story is that St. Bernadette saw Mary during a number of apparitions. And one of the things that Mary uh, asked Bernadette to do was to come on pilgrimage and to drink and bathe in the water there. Um, there've been a number of recorded healing miracles at Lourdes and there's a, a whole kind of formal system for that out there. Uh, and, you know, thousands, millions of people travel to Lourdes every year to, year to do that, to drink and bathe in the water with the intention of being healed. Um, and there's a place in Lourdes called the Grotto. Uh, it's essentially a small cave. I, I, it's described as a cave, but I'd hate to say that. It's more just a kind of indentation in the rock. Um, and there's a, a spring in there. Um, and when, um, during the apparitions, when Bernadette asked, sorry, when Mary asked Bernadette to drink and bathe in the water, there wasn't originally a spring and uh, the spring then appeared. Um, so that spring's still there and the water's kind of pumped out um, to uh, taps very, just down, down from the grotto. Uh, and just to set the scene, imagine a, you know, a pretty substantial river running through what looks like a park with this great big rocky kind of almost, a well, it is a cliff really on the left with a great big church on top. In fact, the church is made up of nine churches. I think it's nine churches. Uh, and that's another thing that Mary asked Bernadette to do. But down at the bottom is the grotto, which is, is being set up sort of like an outside church. Um, so that's that's Lourdes and the reason people travel there. Um, but when we travel there, in fact, you can see, see it here. So I'll just hold up that picture. Hopefully you can see that all right in the camera. But that is our group um, in Lourdes. That's me in my shorts on the left. Um, out in Lourdes, and you can see the, uh, the well, the basilica behind, um, and you can see it's a little bit like Rome. It's got the, um, the sort of walkways coming down, um, and the Greek banner there as well. But when I when I look at that photo, I'm just I'm so proud, and I feel really privileged to be the group leader because it is an amazing thing that the charity does. But the you know the helpers that travel with me. Uh, travel with the group they're just some of the most selfless people I've ever met um, and I mean they come from all walks of life and they all come together at Easter uh, after weeks months of training and visits and kind of getting to know the children and actually the helpers themselves have to pay 650 pounds each for the you know for the privilege of going uh, as well as the fundraising to take the children as well um, so they're a, a really fantastic group of people um, and there is a lot of training, but all the helpers always get one instruction from me each year on top of the training. And the instruction is to make sure the children have the best time they can and to make sure they're always smiling. Uh, the whole reason for going is to make sure these young people are having fun, they're enjoying themselves, because some of them don't get that many opportunities for it, unfortunately. 
So HCPT was founded on the idea that we would not just take a group of sick and disabled young people and have them to, to stay in hospital. Um, it, it was to give them a week of fun to stay in a nice hotel, to go out to cafes and to really feel part of a happy and loving community. Uh, to give a group of young people who often feel left out in their normal lives the chance to be the VIPs and be part of something really special. So what we're asking the helpers is they're truly selfless for a week and to forget about their own needs and to put the needs of the young people we take uh, above everything else. And they really meet this brief. Um, and it's a bit contagious, really. It's, you know, you go out and the intent, the reason for going on the trip is to make young people happy and there is a sort of inherent happiness in in doing that um and what's great is i mean i, I live in harrow here um and i mean the group as i said the group's sort of based in chiswick but we sort of branched out quite a long way and i know you had um you had the head of saint bernadette's school um talk a few weeks ago in fact we were meant to be taking two young young girls in fact three young girls from St Bernadette's who also travel out with the, with the HCPT um, in the, the, the trip last year. Unfortunately, of course, that got cancelled, but I'm really hoping they'll come in the next one. It's just great to get out and, you know, meet these children, give them this opportunity. You never see a smile so big as when we offer the trip <laughs> um, and, you know, find, find a way of making it happen. Um, the other um, lovely thing about the trip is the respite it provides for families. Um, in terms of just giving families uh, a rest um, from sometimes quite challenging home circumstances. Um, so one example, there's a young man who's travelled with us a couple of times um, and he's, he needs 24 hour care. You know, he's a lovely, lovely young man, but he's 24 hour care, unfortunately, really severe learning difficulties. So his parents never really get a break uh, unless kind of people come in to help. Um, so it's not very often someone offers to take him away for an entire week. Uh, and what was great is that we could bring him. He had a fantastic week. I'll tell you more about him later. But the parents actually in that week managed to travel to Venice with their daughter to see her perform um, at a big international music festival, something they'd never been able to do before. Uh, and that whole, you know, the ability to do that, you know, with the trip and everything, it just, it, it yeah, it's a nice feeling. Um, so just to share a couple of stories from when we're actually out, out doing the trip. Um, sure. A young man, this is, this is quite a few years ago now, but it's where I kind of realised how much I liked Lourdes um, and, and the trip. Um, a young man called Andre, uh, who has autism. Uh, he, this is where he travelled first when he was about 10. He's now sure. got to be in his 20s. But um, he came with us and opposite the grotto, you Remember, I described this river running through the middle and the grottoes on the left across from the river is what looks like a big park. So a few trees, quite a lot of open space and sort of up at the back of it kind of goes up a hill and there's trees around it. And he got there and he just started running around. He's only 10. He wasn't running sort of too fast, but just running around and having all this freedom to basically run and play and sort of do whatever he wanted. Uh, and it was great because the helpers were just sort of like a little train running behind him and not to stop him, not to say you can't do it, but with an umbrella and some sun cream and some snacks and just, you know, making sure he had everything you need and be able to sort of go off and do that. And it was it was just brilliant um, sort of to see that happen and see the helpers kind of sort of rallying around to, to make it happen. Um, just sitting around in cafes. Uh, I, in fact, I mean, with COVID, just I mean, we we don't I don't think we take it for granted anymore. Just going out to sort of a restaurant, a cafe, and sitting down and um, kind of enjoying a drink with some friends. But even before COVID, unfortunately, some young people didn't have those opportunities either for monetary reasons or social or disability, whatever it was, they couldn't do it. So we make it a point that that is something we go out and do. You know, it doesn't matter how severe the disability or whatever it is, that's what we go and do. And just that whole experience of sitting down, having a hot chocolate and a bowl of chips, like some of the children, that's the whole, you know, that's a whole trip like that. They love it. And then we throw a lewd twist and with the permission of the owners, someone with a guitar jumps up on a table and starts playing, you know, Rise and Shine, if you know the song. Uh, I might actually do the actions later. We'll see. Um, I mentioned this place, Gavani, before, and uh, it's up in the mountains. It's beautiful. Uh, we get the option of about 10 trips to go on each year. 
Uh, we have to choose, we can't go on all of them, we have to choose them. And every year I insist we go to Gavani because I, I just think it's wonderful. Uh, and mostly because when the sun's out, you can have an outside mass. And we had an outside mass one year with a group from Jamaica. So you had a group from Jamaica, us from Chiswick and another group from, from Croatia. It was, you know, this international group meeting in Gavani, sharing a mass, it was, it was brilliant. And the music, the children, it, it, was, it was amazing. But then other years it's snowing. And just the, the simple thing of having a snowball fight where the young people, well, the helpers graciously stood there while the young people hurled buckets of snow at them or us. Um, it, it, it's, it's a really, really nice thing. And um, one of my favorite stories from Lewis, um, there's a young man who um, is, he's, well, he's been in a wheelchair his whole life and he can't, he can't really do anything for himself. Um, he can't even lift things up really. He can, he can press buttons, that's about it. Um, and he has a hoist that's used to get him in and out of the wheelchair. And the, um, you know, if he needs to go to the loo or get into bed or just change his clothes, this hoist happens. So we thought as a bit of fun, we put the deputy group leader, or sorry, sorry, he's now my deputy, but the group leader at the time, John, we thought we'd put him in the hoist and give, uh, give this young man the button. And he sort of pressed the button, he started going up. And he kept going up and he kept going up and he was nearly at the ceiling by the time the hoist stopped. Um, uh, the young man just, you know, so much laughter, so much fun. It was just, you know, just messing around in the hotel room. It's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's so much fun. Um, and uh, in fact, the final story I thought I'd tell you is, of the, of the, is the trust mass, which happens every year. Uh, thousands and thousands of people travel. Um, it's pretty much a two to one ratio of children. So there's about a third of the organization is the young people that travel. Uh, and Ed, I'm, I'll share the video later, but when Ed first asked me if I could talk tonight, he mentioned a video of the Trust Mass where everyone's singing a song called Rise and Shine. Um, so it's the Trust song, it's an international organization, you have thousands of people and they're all doing actions where they sing rise and shine, give God the glory, glory. They're all doing these actions together. And if you imagine, Every group has different colours. So I should have introduced my top. This is my uh, this is my HCBT top. Our, our group's got an Irish background, hence the green. But all the groups have different colours. Um, the West Indies group had these fantastic yellow, black and gold tops that they, they wear everywhere. And the Croatia group's got kind of red and white and, you know, all these fantastic colours. So this sea of colour, thousands of people all doing these actions together. Um, yeah, if you want something to cheer you up, I'll send around this video of, of the Trust Mass. It's, it's just, it's brilliant because you don't see, you know, a crowd of helpers bringing disabled children to Lewis. You see a, cr a crowd of thousands of people just having fun and really enjoying themselves. Uh, and that's what it's all about is not to pick out that, you know, some people are different or whatever. It's just gr a group of people having loads of fun. So this is my 11th year in Lewis and just... Um, in fact, 11th year in Lewards, and I thought I'd show a collection of some of the badges. They, they, they changed the style, unfortunately, but um, helpers had, you know, if you've traveled for 20 years, helpers had 20 of these badges uh, as a collection. Um, I want to share some things that I've learned from doing this, this work and, you know, meeting the helpers. I, I feel they kind of helped make me the person I am today. Um, patience. Um, I mean, the, you know, Dealing with some, well, I say dealing with, working with some young people who can be very difficult, have very tricky needs, just the patience to sit and give them the time. Um, some people who find it very difficult to get words out or communicate, um, just the patience there. It's, I've, you know, I've learned a lot of that. Uh, just being there for people, you know, sitting down, having a quiet conversation. Uh, some of the people are in wheelchairs. Um, we do like running around, we do like making lots of noise and everything, but some people unfortunately can't do that and actually just sitting, spending time with them, that makes a huge difference to them. Um, integrity of our helpers, they're, they're fantastic. Um, you know, they're trusted to look after some very, very, uh, well, some young people with some very complex needs uh, and I've got absolutely no doubts with them. They, you know, they do a brilliant job. Um, how to have fun <laughs> um, young people can teach us a lot uh, and particularly young people that maybe don't often get sort of picked first or um, you know might not be considered for things but you know how to have fun with them and you know they teach us a lot as well 
um, and just these really examples of selflessness. Um, and I think a takeaway sort of thing from this that I'd sort of like to share is just knowing these fantastic people. And I know the, the Katinians, you, you are a group that is involved in a lot of this sort of work as well in, in terms of charity work and knowing that people are out there kind of supporting things. And unfortunately the group can't run at the moment. So we can't take the children at the moment. We, we will do as soon as we can. Um, they're talking about do, running trips in the UK initially before kind of going back abroad becomes possible. Um, but those people that were out there currently supporting vaccine clinics, uh, volunteering with the NHS, dropping off prescriptions, phoning um, people who might be lonely, and sending Christmas cards around to all the children we previously taken. It's just great to know they're out there. Um, so just to share one last story um, before I finish, um, there's a young man who tra he traveled, the, the second year I traveled to Lewis, the first year I traveled with group 144, um, and he was autistic, well, is, is autistic. Uh, and when I first traveled, he couldn't speak. I was, when I said couldn't speak, he didn't speak. Um, and he spoke mostly through kind of squeaking sounds we'd pinch you. He'd sort of communicate in some form, but you know, it, it, was, it wasn't verbal, it wasn't very clear. And we were out on this prairie run one day, so this big open field opposite the, the grotto. And we're, you know, we're sort of running around playing things. And for the first few days we were out there, he just watched. He didn't engage, he just watched. And that was fine, you know, that's what he wanted to do. And then one day someone, we were sort of playing football and someone kicked the football off and it went way off over there somewhere. Um, and we sort of brought it back and he kind of ran over and intercepted it. And then he just kicked the ball off sort of in that direction. So I ran off and got it and brought it back, put it by his feet, and then he kicked it off in that direction. And then that kind of carried on for a while. He'd sort of, you know, he developed this game. If he kicked the ball off in some random direction, I'd go and get it, bring it back. And he just more and more then each sort of day that went past, he got more involved in some of the games. He got involved in a bit of football and all the rest of it. Um, and by the end of the week, you know, the helpers, we were delighted because he'd sort of gone from not wanting to be involved in anything to, you know, get involved in the games, playing it. It was just really great to see him smiling and having fun with it. So we get back from the trip, you know, we're all feeling very sad because the trip's over. But about a week later, I got a phone call from his mum and she was in tears. And I was like, oh my word, what's wrong, you know? She said, no, nothing's wrong. Something amazing's happened. So they were driving around and he liked, but she knew he liked buses because he'd always look at them when they were driving around. And his mum would always, when they were driving around, ask what the name of the bus was. She knew he'd never reply, but always asked just as a bit of, you know, communication there and she said one day he just said the name of the bus you know he said what's the name of that bus it's a h12 and then she asked the next bus and he said that one as well and she said she drove around till the car ran <laughs> nearly ran out of petrol just because he started speaking again and i kind of somewhere in there that you know the lewis trip the sort of friends he made <coughs> no communication um you know that whole environment, we sort of feel helped him speak and find his voice. And I just, for me, that it's those sort of stories that the amazing thing that kind of keeps us coming back. Um, so thank you all for listening. Thank you for letting me tell you all about my group. Um, and if there's any questions, very happy to answer them. Please do. Thank you very much, James. If anyone has got any questions, um, thank you, Paul, for that round of applause. Um, if, you, if there's anyone who has got any questions, please feel free to um, get our attention and ask James anything you'd like at the moment. We'll take a, we'll take a few questions. Wait for people to come off of mute, if you've got anything. The, the thing I, no, I noticed, James, and it's what, quite key, the one thing you didn't really talk about is we're going to Lourdes, which is a, a very religious, it's, it's a religious hub. Mm -hmm. uh, but you didn't really emphasize about the religious part of it, because in some ways, I suppose the religious part of it, it maybe I'm right or wrong, is, is it secondary to the whole thing of the experience of the children? Um, it, when, when you see the video of the trust mass, when you see, so each group has a chaplain um, and it's, it's all wrapped up in there together. Uh, I mean, the chaplain travel, travels out with us. Um, and in fact, it was our chaplain 
Chaplin, Father Stewart that suggested John get into the hoist and Alex press the button. Um, and yeah, it's all wrapped up in there. It's um, it, it means an awful lot to the children. And actually, we we ha we have mass every day. It's, it's I mean, it's a core value of it is is the the sort of faith side of it. Uh, I mean, it's the whole the whole reason you know traveling to Lourdes. Um, but the brilliant thing is that, particularly say in the trust mass, the priests that travel recognize that the young people that come with us um, often can't they can't behave like you would traditionally expect someone to in in a mass and actually there's a lot of noise there's a lot of movement there's a lot of running around and it's an environment where young people that have these needs can kind of explore their faith and be involved in their faith but not feel excluded and you'll see in the videos of the trust mass some young people at the front running running around or you know moving or jumping up and down and some of them they do that because they can't control it you know some people with some behavioral difficulties or something like sort of physical Tourette symptoms they just can't not do it um and the fact that they feel so comfortable they're doing it so if, yeah sorry if that didn't quite come across but actually it, it all comes in there together and it's, it's one of the most important things and brilliant things about it no it wasn't a criticism my, my point was more that it doesn't have to be the whole religious part of it. The experience is more than just the, the mass itself. It's the football games. It's the mm -hmm. fun in the dormitories. It's the being in the cafe with the children. That's the whole part of the whole experience. Mm -hmm. Any anyone want to just add anything? Yes, uh, Ed. Um, hello, James. Could you tell us something, anything about the trials and tribulations of actually getting there, uh, the travel? It will seem to be quite a problem with uh, uh, people's disabilities. Um, well, actually, in, in the old days, everyone travelled by train and um, it took about 36 hours from start to finish. Um, so most of it's travelling by plane. Um, but when you say sort of difficulties getting there, actually even just getting through the airport. And if, if anyone has any experience with autism, going through an airport with a child who's autistic, um, is tricky um they don't like noise they don't well often often don't like noise often don't like crowded places and i mean an airport's an airport uh, i remember one year um we had so in fact the, the boy um the, the autistic sort of 10 year old that ran ran around the prairie when we were coming through uh gatwick um he saw security and had a complete not not you know he just wasn't very happy and he, he sort of jumped onto me hugging me and I remember the security guard saying he has to walk through that security machine. <laughs> I was there like, you know, <laughs> you can try and get him off me. So they're actually very accommodating and got us through like a special scanner and everything. But that that's I mean, that's the nice thing about it. Um, you know, the helpers find a way of making it work. The, the trust is well known and we give the airports and stuff a heads up beforehand. Um, but it always happens. Then there was one year we had um, the boy with the um, the hoist. Actually, he can't fly anymore because of the way his chair works, and he yeah, it's just difficult. Um, so we took a train that year, uh, and I still remember he he loves the mass. This this young man, uh, in fact, he's he's loved lockdown because he can just tune into any mass he wants uh, any time of the day. And I remember we were on the train for 36 hours and I must have read through his mass book about 200 times. Um, he just, that's, that's all he wanted to do. And that's, you know, that's what we did. So it's that when you make the traveling kind of part of the fun and they were having games, we, we charter our own flights. And if you imagine a, a plane full of people dressed in silly outfits and singing and all of the cabin staff get on board and start singing Rise and Shine down the microphone, you, you know, you're in the right place. Oh yeah, thank you. Pleasure. In your group, James, how many youngsters would you take? Um, oh, yeah, tricky question. No, no more than ten. Um, but then it's a it's a balance. So some years we've taken children with much more needs. In fact, so one year we had one child had to have five helpers with him, and in fact we needed support from young people because. He needed, you know, you had to have 24 hour supervision. So people up through the night. Um, so that year, I think we only took four or five children just because of the, the amount of care needed. 
Uh, whereas other years, yeah, we, we say no more than 10. I mean, a group, because then it's about two to one ratio with the helpers and you don't want more than 30. Otherwise the group gets a bit too big and you just don't quite connect as well. Hmm. And James, you said it's about 650 for a helper to go. How much does it cost to take each child? Um, the actual cost is near a 900 pounds. Uh, in fact, the, my, my deputy John, he's, he's the most brilliant fundraiser I've ever met because the, the group spends about 17,000 pounds a year. Uh, and it's all, you know, it's all raised. And, and to be honest, most of it through church connections. Um, sort of kind of based in the Chiswick Parish, but I know, so our local St. Joseph's, uh, they sponsored, um, they, well, they, they sometimes sponsored some of our young helpers to go um, and donated some money to help the children at sort of local children as well. Uh, so fantastic support from the church. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much, James. I don't think, uh, I can't see the full screen, but I don't think there's any other questions at the moment, unless I'll pause for a second if there's anyone, I don't want to miss anyone out. In, in that case. Yeah, Patricia's got a question. Well, go, go on, carry on. Um, hi. Um, I have actually, I've been to Lourdes in the last couple of years, um, partly because I was travelling through France and it, uh, as an ex-pupil of St Bernadette's myself. I was very keen to, when I saw the signs as we were travelling, I was very keen to go along and actually see it and it wasn't a time when there was anything in particular going on there were no services no nothing but um it it was fascinating to me to be there and my overall sense of it was the calmness of the area because when i walked on i was really quite surprised because i i suppose i expected it to be a bit more oldie worldly worldy but it's been developed so much and um, there's a lot of new buildings, a lot of um, accommodation for people who have disabilities. And I didn't know whether you stayed on the com, I call it a complex, I know it isn't, but I didn't know whether you managed to get rooms there or whether you had to book hotels outside the area. But um, it's got, you were saying about, you know, were they involved in the mass, were they, et cetera, et cetera. But the whole place, there's a calmness and a spirituality, which you just can't describe, really. You go there and you just feel different. I don't know, I don't know what it is about it, but it, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And it's not beautiful it's, it's almost too clean and too um, developed, if you like. But as long as you miss the, um, the selling the holy water bottles as you go down the road, then it, it's actually the rest of it is, it is fabulous. And I, could, I would say that is a sort of religious experience, just being there and being there with lots of other young people where you feel the same as them. And you know you you have that experience. I I thought it was wonderful. I know my brother's there. He's putting a thumbs up to me because, um, you know we we still remember our times at St Bernadette's and and uh, our experiences and and it's wonderful. It, it is a wonderful wonderful place, and I could see how um, you know people with disabilities the opportunity to be with other people so they are not a minority they are a majority then that is a learning experience in itself and that will boost their confidence and um, give them something to hold on to and I think it, I think you're doing a fabulous job and thank you very much for the way you've spoken tonight because you're so keen and so enthusiastic yeah. and I did notice that about a lot of the helpers that were there we saw them sat around in cafes and um you know with with the people they were helping there were wheelchairs everywhere and it wasn't an Easter it, we went in um the end of September and uh it, it just it was alive and it was cherishing and caring and hats off to you <laughs> Yep. Off to you. I, I, indeed, I think we'd all, we'd all echo those words, Patricia. Thank you very much. Um, conscious of time, unless there's somebody who just wants to add anything very quickly, I think we'll, we'll carry on. James, on behalf of everyone here tonight, can I say 
um, how eloquent you were. Thank you very much for those words. Um, I will share this video with everyone. I'll also put out the Rise and Shine mass video, which I think is so uplifting and it's worth everybody watching that. It will, I refuse to say that you will not be smiling when, by the time you finish watching that. What you spoke about tonight, James, shows how uplifting, how motivational, how inspiring uh, the group can be for these young people. And the other thing is, they are young people. You call them young adults. Yes, we are all different. And they are no different to anybody else. But they're young adults who just need to, a bit more care. And the care you give them is fantastic. So I know some of us are on mute, some of us aren't on mute. But can we just give James a big round of applause to thank him very much for everything. And as I say that, I will stop recording now as well.